Welcome to Framed. Today we have Steve Tyson with us. He's an artist living in the Capital Region, um, teaching at Schenectady County Community College, State University of New York, and he's most recently co-curated the 25-year celebration of black dimensions in art that's at the Albany County Airport. Welcome, Steve. I'm well, glad to have much. you here. Thank you, Janice. Good. It's a pleasure to be here. Good. We met some time ago and finally got together to have you on the show and yes. talk about your art. Yes. Well, I'm so pleased to be here here and I'm, I'm looking forward to having a great conversation. Oh great. Mm -hmm. Now some of uh, Steve's work is around us mm -hmm. and I can see that you um, work in some different medium. Yes. What's your primary medium? Well primarily acrylic and canvas. Uh, the works that you see here are primarily acrylic on canvas. This is watercolor on paper. Um, that's the other media that I work in. Sometimes I work with collage too. Oh, you do. Found bits of material and organize that on a two-dimensional surface. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm a watercolor painter, pretty much exclusively. Yes. So um, mm -hmm. it's always interesting when people find their comfort level in a lot mm -hmm. of different mediums. Mm -hmm. I really, especially love this one, of course, being the watercolor work that it is. Yes. Thanks. Now, what was your influence on this piece? Well, this is called Ritual Walk. And uh, it was inspired by a piece of sculpture that I picked up in Southern Africa when I was in Namibia. And uh, I created this composition one evening uh, late at night. I was looking at the work, and, and, I, and I started to, to paint it on the paper. And as I began to continue to explore it and, and create other forms around it, it reminded me of a figure walking or going through a passage and, uh, and with these rather mysterious types of uh, imagery around it. And I said, there's something mysterious about that, but there's also something almost religious or spiritual yeah. about it. And so I called it Ritual Walk. Ah. Yeah. And how about this piece? What's the story behind this? Okay. Well, this one is called Vibe. And Vibe was created uh, around 1995. It's a piece that relates to uh, essentially vibrations. Uh, one of the things that I'm very much interested in is music and the relationship to music and visual art. Okay. And the thing that both of them have in common, of course, mm -hmm. are vibrations. Oh. And so I was very much interested in exploring vibratory effects on a two-dimensional surface <sighs> in this manner. One thing I had noticed when I first looked at this piece when Steve arrived at the studio was it's actually sectioned off with um, mm -hmm. different patterns within each section. Mm -hmm. So are you doing that with masking tape? Yeah. Taping off sections of the canvas? Exactly. Parts of it are masked off and I rework other areas. Some areas I overlap uh, certain sections of it in order to create the illusion that uh, different planes are uh, going beyond or behind certain forms oh, and emerging okay. in other places. Uh, and that's mm. something that uh, I had begun exploring a couple of years earlier, but this is wow. where it came to fruition. And wow. I continued uh, along those lines. As an artist, it looks like a very challenging piece to work with because you're dealing with different plane dimensions as well as the different color schemes in each section as well as different patterns. Absolutely. So it's a pretty involved piece that is a joy to look at because you keep seeing other parts of it the longer you look at Absolutely. it. And you know, one of the other things about this piece that's interesting to me is that although the genesis of this work began with a piece, as I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. that related to music, particularly Spanish guitar music, oh. uh, classical music, and East Indian music, uh, it was called, a particular piece called Floral Mist. Mm -hmm. This development actually began to really um, come together once I went to Southern Africa. And it was during that trip that mm -hmm. I went to a women's cooperative. Uh, the different ethnic groups in Southern Africa, and particularly in Namibia, had been separated from one another uh, by the system of apartheid okay. in Southern Africa. And so one of the things as the country was coming together and healing some of the, the uh, emotional and psychological wounds of that particular period was to get the different ethnic groups together. And one of the ways of doing this was by creating a women's cooperative where women were creating textile patterns and clothing mm. which could be sold, provide money for their families, but also give them an opportunity to come together. Oh, to unify. Okay. And so looking at the textile patterns mm -hmm. 
was one of the reasons why I began mm. to more fully explore the idea of patterning in my work. Mm. And this particular piece that you see here, which is called Penduka, is in the language of, in, in Namibia, means okay. wake up. It is a term that's used in that part of, uh, of Africa, which means to wake up, arise. You know, use all of your strengths, all of your, your energy in order to work together. And so I showed the way in which you can see pieces of thread here yes. that you would find in the patterns and the flame, which is a symbol of faith, all coming together as one in a composition. So in many wow. ways, this is symbolic of that experience of seeing people working together and unifying mm -hmm. through their crafts. Wow. And that yeah. looks as though it's almost mm -hmm. musical in a way, too. It's sort of, you know, jumping around on the canvas. So there's a lot of energy. I guess that's what it makes me feel, a lot of stimulus, a lot of energy yes. within that work. Yes. Um, now, is that acrylic also? This is also acrylic mm -hmm. on canvas, absolutely. And very patternly again, with different sections and different patterns that you've almost collaged together in a way into yes. one lovely piece of art. Absolutely. And in a way, some people would say that not only is it like collage, mm -hmm. but it is like music in terms of yeah. musical patterns and how ah. music is put together in varying melodies and patterns and so forth, different colors mm -hmm. and sounds, but also the way in which different groups, different ethnicities okay. and so forth, as I saw, mm -hmm. were finding a way, like a collage, to come together oh, and wonderful. unify into a complete or composite, into a whole. Huh. Would you say that uh, your work is a reflection of your political views or issue-oriented? Well, I wouldn't say that it's, uh, I'm motivated simply by trying to make an overt political statement mm -hmm. in my work. But very much I believe that it is important to try, as in a composition, to bring the strengths, to, be, to bring those qualities uh, that we all uh, hold as important mm -hmm. and value in our lives, and bring those together for the unification and for the well-being of the whole whether That's that be in society, right. whether that be in a community, mm -hmm. right? And everyone has different levels of responsibility related That's to true. that, right? Yes. So ideally, what you want to do is mm -hmm. try to harness those energies in the most positive way, mm -hmm. right? So that you can have a more effective community. Okay. And so like a composition, an artist tries mm -hmm. to get the various elements together. They might be disparate elements. And in a sense, like a symphony or an, or, wow. or a, an arrangement of music, to organize those into a composite whole that's pleasing and satisfying and <laughs> harmonious in some way. Where does your musical influence come from? Is that mm -hmm. uh, your love of music? Did you study music um, well, from a musical family? <laughs> How did it happen to be a bonding agent in your art? Well, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, music has always been very much a part of uh, my life. Growing up, there was music in the home. There was artwork in the home. We would go, I grew up in New York City, okay. and we went to Lincoln Center, and we would see the operas, and mm -hmm. of course in operas you have costumes and theater, mm. colors, you know, there's art, music, performance, everything together. Um, and then later on I went to the High School of Music and Art in New York City, and while we were painting, mm -hmm. doing watercolor or drawing, music would be coming from the students oh, from playing the in the hallways. from the other studios in the yes. school, okay. And City College, the mm -hmm. City College uh, was across the street. And oh, sometimes okay, stuff like 135th Street exactly, or something? Exactly, yes. exactly. Okay. And so they would have school. groups out there, Earth, mm -hmm. Wind and Fire, or some other musical groups would be playing, and we would hear this music mm -hmm. going on while we were um, creating uh, mm. two-dimensional works of art. But wow. I wanted to mention something else mm -hmm. about the experience in Africa. I noticed that Art, uh, music, dance, performance, all of those things seem to be unified. Okay. They seem to be one total expression. Mm -hmm. And that's something I began to appreciate, that life and, and art were so interrelated, so intertwined. Mm -hmm. You know, that people, in a sense, the way they walked, the way they carried themselves, you know, the way they spoke, was a living art. Wow. Right? Not something that was simply a museum aesthetic, something that you could take and separate from life mm -hmm. in some way, but it was mm -hmm. very much a part of the their living life. experience. Their Absolutely. Life. And uh, you're a Fulbright fellow twice over, Yes. Um, and it's brought you to Africa each time, correct? That's so different correct. areas in Africa, mm -hmm. and um, I 
think that that has definitely had an effect on your work. Uh, how did it change your work? Were you painting in a different way before, or doing the collage in a different way? Well, that's interesting. Well, as I mentioned before, there was the emphasis uh, going to Namibia, which was my second Fulbright okay. uh, to Africa about five years ago. Along with Botswana. Uh, and correct? Botswana, get, that's right. Namibia okay. and Botswana, that's right. It All was right. a, a five-week uh, experience oh, in, in southern Africa and most memorable. Mm -hmm. I had an opportunity to stay with families and uh, learn more about mm -hmm. the cultures that existed there. Well, I think that's how you get the true flavor of any country that you visit is really staying with families, mm -hmm. um, being in maybe even smaller communities, mm -hmm. sharing in the real true life. Um, yes. You know, I love being a tourist, I do, but I know the greatest growth I've had in travel has been through really mm -hmm. connecting with families and really having the experience Absolutely. of life there. Absolutely. And, and so, in a sense, to, to address your question mm -hmm. about how did that influence me, um, people influence me. Okay. You know, the environment influences me. Mm -hmm. It finds its way into my work, and I, I don't always know exactly how it's going to manifest itself. It's not always a conscious decision, mm -hmm. like, well, I love these patterns, and so therefore I'm going to incorporate this, you know, okay. in my painting. But somehow through osmosis mm -hmm. and just by internalizing that experience mm -hmm. and reflecting on it from time to time, I find that it finds its way into my work. And I think one of the important things that those journeys have done, as well as my journeys to Europe as well, mm -hmm. um, is that uh, in talking with people, it reinforces the sense of, of humanity you know, of what it means to be a human being, uh, that uh, you find interesting similarities wherever you go. Oh, that's great. You know, people feel uh, um, excitement, people feel pain, mm -hmm. people feel joy, they feel sadness, and this is something that you see wherever you go. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that in a sense it did was it reinforced some of my feelings about myself, who mm. I was. And it made me also, it gave an opportunity for me to look at myself in new ways, through fresh eyes, mm. right? To more, have a, to sort of step back and recognize certain patterns or characteristics that certainly identify me as an American. Mm. If you ever yes. want to know what it is to be an <laughs> American, you go to another country, <laughs> that's, right. that's right, and you really <laughs> then begin to see how American you are. Yes, that's correct. You know? And uh, so it's, I think, very important. Travel has, and, and journeying to different countries has been very important to mm. me and to share ideas and to learn new things mm -hmm. from other cultures. That's what I was wondering is, uh, were you able to meet other artists while you were in Africa? Mm -hmm. And maybe what ways were they working that differed from the way you were, not so much in subject, but uh, materials mm. and uh, process? Uh, did you find they painted outside more or um, in studios or in their kitchen? Or? <laughs> Actually, it's interesting because when, when I was in Nigeria, okay. uh, I had an opportunity to visit a cooperative by a woman named uh, Nike Olanyi. And she was married to a very famous international artist by the name of Twin77, who I also oh. met. And Nikkei was working essentially with Batik, and she All had right. artists coming from Europe and the United States and so forth, and staying with her. Wow. And, and they were working outdoors, and they had mm. various vats where they um, were, had the dyes that were used in the batiking process. Mm -hmm. And then she showed me the technique of using a piece of styrofoam and dipping it into wax, wax. into uh, um, melted wax, yes. and then using that as, like a large pencil to uh, draw the designs oh, to draw onto the with fabric it like that. Okay. Yeah. And I began to think about ways of using uh, masking material mm -hmm. in watercolor mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. using that to paint the liquid on, on mask. That's okay. right. That's right. And I mm -hmm. said, you know, there are certain similarities, oh. certain interesting approaches. Now, sometimes it might be in terms of the subject matter. Mm -hmm. For example, with Twin 77, a lot of his um, artwork related to some of the mythologies or religious or spiritual traditions of the Yoruba, which is an, a major ethnic group in Nigeria of which he is a part. Yes. And so some of the themes and stories might be different or the characters might be different. Wow. But to the extent that some of the themes and stories relate to um, problems, situations mm -hmm. uh, that we might all be familiar with in some way or another, mm -hmm. uh, therefore then it has a universal aspect as well. And I, real, I began to realize that I could tell my own story. I could communicate my own stories 
which in many ways are quite similar. Mm -hmm. You know, they are part of the human experience. Nothing human is alien to <laughs> us, right? I mean, we may be coming from different areas of the world, but I began, that began, that's going back to what I said before about affirming uh, my own humanity, my mm -hmm. own experiences, that my experience, yes, they in certain ways are unique to me. Okay. Uh, but that uh, the thing that seems to be universal about it is that that I have a story to tell mm -hmm. and that I can find a way using the visual arts in order to communicate that story mm -hmm. in my own way. So that was one of the things that okay. I began to learn and appreciate through my experience yeah. in travel. Because I think that uh, generally to think of batik or textile work from Africa, I mean I know a lot of our textiles are being um, made in Kenya and um, you know that that's something that I think I would think of. Mm -hmm. um, but it's always interesting to see the different materials that are used for art because we generally get caught kind of in this little box, you know, we have to use certain things and it's so great to be around people that are just free with it, they can experiment, they've, they're out of a box, they've never been in a box <laughs> to begin with, which is even better mm -hmm. to just kind of explore uh, different ways of doing things, uh, like you're saying with the styrofoam. I think that's yes. pretty exciting. Yes, and you know what's also interesting, if I may say, is that um, I also began to see and, and learn more about the fact that, that traditional forms mm -hmm. of African art um, that the artists were not free in the way that we might think. Okay. Artists like Picasso and George Brock and Brancusi who mm -hmm. were inspired by African art in the development of what became Cubism and modern art yes. and so forth. What some artists didn't realize is that those traditional African artists were working within certain uh, guidelines, mm. that there were certain laws and principles upon which uh, they, had to, they had to create. So mm -hmm. what for many European artists in the modernist sense was a liberation for themselves mm -hmm. as they began to explore or mm -hmm. a freedom to break free of certain Western traditions. Certain traditional African artists were working conservatively within certain mm. guidelines. Really? It was just a different conceptual approach. Mm. And so that, that idea was reinforced to me as I began to see traditional forms of art in Africa, as well as meeting artists like Nikkei and Twin Seven Seven, and uh, many other artists who were working in a more modernist mm -hmm. approach or more Western tradition, but taking that tradition and creating a new African oh, art or a new Nigerian art. Did, would you say the process of making art or studying art in Nigeria mm -hmm. was quite different from uh, Southern Africa when you were in? Uh, Botswana. Uh, did you see big differences there? I saw, I saw similarities. I saw uh, woodcut techniques being mm -hmm. used or linoleum cut prints being, being made in both, both areas. Um, but the thing about uh, Namibia is mm -hmm. that uh, it had only had independence for about three or four years when I had arrived there. Oh, goodness, great and time so, to be. <laughs> that's right, and, and a lot there. of the creative arts mm -hmm. had been suppressed and had been up, the people had been oppressed, mm -hmm. and so much of the creativity um, had been kept away from the public. Um, oh. And so for that mm -hmm. reason, they were developing their traditions anew. They were bringing some of those traditions out and creating new traditions. So when I arrived there in 1995, it was really the beginning of a renaissance. It was oh, a new tradition. Grand. So it didn't have the track record mm -hmm. that Nigeria had had being out of, well, at that time when I was there in 88, they had had independence for about 28 years. Okay. So they had had more of a longer tradition of modernist art and approaches to creating new forms of, of identity in mm -hmm. that country than Namibia had when I was there. Mm -hmm. Now on the other hand, Botswana had had independence for about 30 years mm -hmm. when I had arrived there. So they had uh, galleries and museums uh, devoted to not only traditional but also modern uh, uh, contemporary uh, Botswana art. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, um, how's your family come into play with all of this? Did you grow up in an artistic mm -hmm. home, and uh, mm -hmm. does your uh, do your children and wife participate in art as well? Yes. Well, my I, my wife is very creative. Uh, okay. She would not call herself an artist per se, <laughs> uh, but my children, of course, like like the arts. I grew up, though, in New York City where, as I mentioned, there was a lot of cultural influences. And as I mentioned before, we had paintings, uh, 
Leonardo da Vinci, or Prince of Leonardo da okay. Vinci, <laughs> <laughs> and Picasso, and African art in our home. Okay. So um, art was always around, as I mentioned, mm. music as well. Uh, but I also, my, I would say my mother, she was also, for a brief period of mm -hmm. time, a model. Oh. And the way in which she used to dress, the oh. way she would put jewelry and clothing together, mm -hmm. I think had an influence on me. My father would come home from work, and some days he would come home with a new shirt, and it had cardboard in it. And yes. he would take the cardboard out, and he would give that to me, and I would draw on it, oh, okay. or boxes. And then he would smoke cigars. So he would take his cigar box, mm -hmm. and that would be my... Uh, treasure chests of, of pencils and crayons mm. and things, and that's where I kept my art supplies. That's a good place for them, yes. right? And then also, I had a cousin who passed away about five years ago, Abel de Knight, who was a, a, an incredible artist. Mm. And in fact, I'm working on a retrospective of his work next year. Oh, so that's the next good. project that's coming up. Do you think you'll have that uh, in this in this area, or are you yes, going to keep fact, it to uh, I'm, New I'm York hoping City? To, well, I'm I'm hoping to have an ex <laughs> a smaller exhibition of his work sometime in the spring. Good. Uh, in Schenectady. Good. So that's in the works right good. now. I know yeah. what you were talking about. I could kind of feel it um, when you're talking about being near City College and mm -hmm. when you were at the um, Music and Art School. So I was living on Claremont oh. by Grant's Tomb, so right near the Manhattan School of Music. Oh, great. And I great. would be, you know, in the evenings painting and yes. hearing all the saxophones and everything playing <laughs> through the windows. and. I just really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not one to turn on the radio to mm -hmm. paint, and I generally don't have it on at home mm -hmm. just for, you know, hanging around home. <laughs> and so being in the apartment and hearing live music, but hearing people practicing is yes. what it is. They're yes. practicing their pieces, mm -hmm. and to go from one end of the apartment to the other, or even to leave the building and come back, and someone's playing the cello, and mm -hmm. someone's singing, and mm -hmm. whatever, it's just a really great uh, feeling. It's sort of like you're almost immersed in it. Yes, And I yes, think that's kind of neat and kind mm. of feeling what you're talking about in Africa too, of just mm. sort of that osmosis, just being in that environment. Yes. And um, you almost do, you really absorb it. I think mm -hmm. artists are generally sensitive people and mm -hmm. you really absorb the influence, you absorb the feelings without oh, really so. sitting down and mapping it out. It just kind of comes to you. How did that all, uh, or did that all bring you around to being part of Black Dimensions and mm -hmm. Art? Um, and is that a national organization or is it local? Tell us a little bit about well, that. Well, Black Dimensions and Art started uh, 25 years ago. Okay. And uh, of course, as you mentioned, they're celebrating their 25th anniversary. Yes. And um, the show at the Albany International Airport reflects artists that are national and international in scope. So Black Dimensions in Art, which was started by Margaret Cunningham and other oh. individuals, um, she also started the Hamilton Hill Art Center okay. as well, uh, essentially was an organization that is locally based, mm -hmm. but essentially national and international in terms of its reach oh, and influence. Okay. And so mm. it's an exciting show going on. It's called mm. Sankofa, and Sankofa refers to the, uh, a con word for a mythical bird that looks back as it's flying and moving forward, it looks back. And the importance of that is to, it's important to look to the past in order okay. to learn and gain wisdom from the past as you move forward into the future. Oh, okay. So we're looking back at 25 years of Black Dimensions yes. and Art as we're moving forward into the future. Okay, because yeah. I noticed at the show that people mm -hmm. were from outside of the area, yes. but I had thought that it was a, a local organization, so it was yes. created locally. Yes, it was. But it does reach out uh, across the country and across the world to Absolutely. artists there. Um, no, the show is really fabulous. There's a lot of different types of art there um, between watercolor and painting, some yes. sculptural pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's definitely worth going to see. I really enjoyed it. Oh, and yes. uh, you co-curated it. So yes. were you involved with um, Sharon Bates? or? Yes, I worked with Sharon Bates. <laughs> it was a wonderful opportunity to work with Sharon Bates and Liz Blum at the Albany oh, okay. uh, International <laughs> Airport. And uh, I was... Um, uh, invited uh, to to uh, curate mm -hmm. and, and then subsequently co-curate the show um, through Black Dimensions in Art and with uh, Sharon Bates. 
and um, it was a it was a process of identifying the artists, traveling mm -hmm. to their studios, mm. uh, selecting the work, uh, traveling to New York City, mm -hmm. making lots of phone calls and uh, uh, across the country. And uh, but it was a marvelous experience, mm -hmm. and we got to meet a lot of great artists, I and it's a, it was a great opportunity to showcase a local arts organization yes. in in this region. Uh, and, and how significant it is uh, over the past 25 years. Uh, it was created essentially because there weren't opportunities, uh, as there should have been, for African Americans to exhibit their work in the region. Okay. That has changed somewhat over yes, the, the years. Yes, with the Hamilton Hill Art Center, yes. and uh, there's mm -hmm. a lot going on, I think, specifically in Schenectady, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. but um, hopefully doors are opening everywhere uh, yes. for people to be free to express themselves regardless mm -hmm. of gender or race or um, religion. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, we're all part of the human race. That's correct. Essentially there is People forget that. the human race. That's right. <laughs> Despite the superficial differences. Yeah. As I said before, my travels have, have shown me that, you know, we all uh, love, we, we have mm -hmm. uh, good times, we have sad times, you know, so there are more things that we have in common, you know, than That's the correct. differences. We should celebrate those distinctions mm -hmm. and those, those unique qualities that we all have. But we should also recognize the things that we have in common as well. Well, mm -hmm. Steve, um, as a closing note, I just mm -hmm. want to hold up this one mm -hmm. painting. And if you would like to tell me in brief, uh, mention about this work. Well, in a sense, this painting that you're holding up mm -hmm. sums up some of the things that I've been sharing that we've been right. talking about. It's called constructive engagement. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the idea is how, well, first of all, I should tell you that that work was very uh, was a struggle putting that together. <laughs> it went through various uh, beginnings and stops and starts, mm -hmm. but the idea was that in the end it came together That's as great. a unified composite whole. Super. I'm so glad mm -hmm. that you brought all of these beautiful paintings to us today mm -hmm. and got to hear a little bit about your experiences in Africa. I think there are several shows there <laughs> that would be certainly of interest to many people. Well, so thank you so much. Thank you very much, yeah. Janice. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Good. I and enjoy take talking care. with you. Thank Good. you very much. Okay, bye bye.